Thank you. Among all the challenges that humans have faced, infectious diseases are perhaps unique in their influence on our civilization and perhaps even the survival of our species. Twice in the modern era, in the 6th century and the 14th century, a hundred years of pestilence wiped out half of the European population. In the 20th century, 500 million people succumbed to smallpox. As late as 1967, two million people died. But these are not historical problems. Today in the world, one third of the population suffers from tuberculosis, one out of three, with many hundreds of thousands having diseases that are untreatable by any antibiotics that we can give. But it's not just far away or in further distant lands. I became really acquainted with infectious diseases when I ran the critical care unit, Children's Medical Center, just right up the road. In the 1990s, we had a horrible outbreak of meningococcal meningitis, and I lived my personal nightmare of having to tell dozens of parents that their child who is well in the morning would not live to the next day. Or many of those children developed gangrene in their arms and their legs, their fingers, their toes, their faces, and they would be indistinguishable from victims of the Black Death that occurred in the sixth century. Indistinguishable. But we face a new problem these days, and that is not just the ancient diseases, they're new diseases. Every day since 19, about 50 new diseases have emerged since the 1970s. A great example of this is SARS, uh, within, uh, it, which emerged in 2003 in Hong Kong. Within a few weeks, it spread to 37 countries and infected over 8,500 people. It was spread because we had new and close contact with animals that we had never been in contact with. This time it was the palm civet. The palm civet is a cute little creature, but in the markets in Guangdong, it was actually used as a food source. We now face an unnatural threat as well, and that is the threat of intentional bioterrorism by rogue nations or terrorist organizations. This will really worsen in the area of molecular biology because we can now put in different genes that have resistance to pathogens or resistance to antibiotics that we cannot control. In fact, we can create whole new organisms just by transmitting sequences of DNA over the internet. What took me 25 years ago in a very sophisticated laboratory in a medical school can now be done basically here in a box. For about $80 in ages 10 and above, you can do 10 DNA experiments. It has a mixer, it has a gel electrophoresis chamber, it has chromatographic paper, everything you need to do, and this is for ages 10 and above. And it is clear where this is really going in the future. <laughs> Our generation made simple circuits and radios. The next generation will cure cancer. They will solve, solve Alzheimer's, but they will also have the ability to create new organisms, perhaps even new forms of life in your garage. But before we tackle exotic infections or perhaps new bioterrorist agents, I'd like to talk about a very practical concern that we have every year, and that is influenza, the flu. Because if we can't fix flu, we cannot fix anything. The cause of the flu was determined in 1933 to be a virus, and here's a picture of a virus. It was a novel orthomyxovirus just discovered. Soon thereafter, a vaccine was made, and it was made by a very clever mechanism, by injecting a little bit of the flu virus into embryonated, fertilized chicken eggs that grew the virus to a certain degree, and then that virus was purified and given back to people. So in World War II, some of our soldiers began to get immunized against the flu. Now, the flu shot you get every year now in the United States is made by the exact same mechanism. 1930s technology, in fact, over 600 million eggs from pathogen-free chickens and eggs that have been fertilized are used in a very automated way to make the flu. Now, this flu vaccine. Now, this is a very tried and true uh, technique, but it is still 1930s technology, and there lies the problem. 
The problem is it collapses under a time pressure. And when is there a time pressure? When there is a new strain of flu that's circulating around the world that we have not been exposed to, a pandemic strain. Pandemics are not a new thought. The first one was documented in 1580, and they've occurred every 10 to 30 years since that time. So it's not really a matter of whether there will be another flu pandemic, but when it will occur. Most of us are familiar with the 1918 flu pandemic, in which one third of the world became ill. 50 million people around the world died, including 675,000 in the United States. In 2009, a new flu virus spread across the United States and across the world. The first case was diagnosed April 15th, and a global pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization in mid-June. Now, we tend to think of H1N1, the swine flu in the United States, as a mild pandemic, something that occurs all the time. But if you look at the numbers, 61 million people in the United States got H1N1. It caused 275,000 hospitalizations and 12,500 deaths. And those deaths did not occur in the 60s, 70s, 80-year-old age group. It was mostly in the 20s and 30s, with pregnant women suffering five-fold the mortality of any other group. But as bad as that is, it's the story that never happened that is the true cause for concern. The US government wanted to have 120 million doses of flu vaccine by October of that year. How many did we have? 16 million. Not 120 million, but 16 million. So what happened is despite decades of work, $30 billion a year in investment in the, from the NIH, the US could not meet the challenge of the flu pandemic. And why is that? Because we were re relying on 1930s era technology. The fact that only 12,500 people died instead of 10 million in the US is only fortuitous. It was just a chance event that this flu virus did not have the mortality of the 1918 flu virus or of the H5N1 that's now circulating around the world with a mortality rate of about 50%. So many people say we dodged a bullet. That's not true. As the senior medical advisor to the National Security Council said, we did not dodge a bullet. Nature hit us right in the chest, but this time she was shooting a BB gun. So how do we solve a problem like flu, much less uh, exotic infectious diseases or bioterrorism agents? And the first thing I would like to say is I respect all the medical innovations that have occurred throughout this country and throughout the world. But the medical community, myself included, are stuck in a very incremental risk-averse paradigm. We do things one base pair at a time, literally. Uh, we are not rewarded for having big ideas that could solve things. Uh, we reduce the problem to very little bitty pieces. We solve those little bitty pieces, then try to reassemble them. And I, I really do believe that if physicians and life scientists were running the NASA program, we might just be getting somebody into orbit right now. So my personal liberation came in the late 1990s when working on the meningococcal meningitis here in Dallas, I was asked to join an academic advisory group for, then became the first physician office director of an organization I had never heard of before. And that organization is called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was formed in 1958 after Sputnik to assure that the US would always be technologically superior to all of its enemies and would never be caught by surprise, like Sputnik. Its successes are storied. NASA came out of DARPA. The internet was formed by DARPA. And, and no, Pre Vice President Gore never worked there, as far as I can tell. Stealth technology, GPS, UAVs, the entire field of material science was imagined by DARPA, and then it implemented and it became true. Immediately, I was overtaken by the DARPA method. There was no conventional paradigm at all. The question, why not, occurred on a daily basis. My colleagues were not just physicians and life scientists. They were computer programmers. They were engineers, physicists, roboticists, even science fiction writers. And when I was invited to be the first office director as an MD, we generated many, many different answers because we never accepted the constraints implied by the original questions. Let me give you an example. Half of our people on the battlefield were dying of hemorrhagic shock. 
from bleeding out without resuscitation. So we were asked if we could find a better blood substitute. Well, that's not a question that DARPA likes to hear. What about can we make it so people don't need blood or a circulation? That's a very different question than finding a different blood substitute. So we engaged a community, we built a community, and it's very easy to engage it when you're at DARPA because you have money and flexibility. And we described the first chemicals that could induce suspended animation in mammals. Uh, Mark Roth at the Fred Hutchison deanimated the first mouse in our program in 2005. And deanimation technologies to allow people to survive essentially with no blood flow for four to six hours were in clinical trials as early as 2008. We went to Walter Reed to essentially be asked to build a better crutch so that people can get around better after they lost their limbs. Instead, DARPA would not accept such a medical answer. So we created, and I know you've seen Dean Kamen, who was part of this program, and we can have lots of talks about those discussions getting Dean as part of this, but we created the world's truly first bionic arm uh, with the intent not of just putting a prosthesis for cosmesis, but really so if a person lost their arm and they played the piano before they went overseas, they would be able to play the piano afterwards. And of course, this was not just controlled by some muscular control, it was controlled by the brain. Like the gadget guy told you earlier, we pioneered technologies to read not only brainwave signals, but signals from two to three neurons individually, so we can drive this device with full movements of fingers, ar uh, arms, anything that was needed. Uh, it's a naturally controlled, uh, naturally controlled limb. So when you apply these thoughts to infectious diseases, you know, what do you get? Well, this was a national strategy at the time. What we're going to do right now, we know that emerging diseases come every year and we don't know what they are. We know that the bad guys have genetic engineering and can make whatever they want. But our national strategy is to try to predict what is going to happen, take 15 to 20 years to make a new product, put it in the stockpile, advertise that it's in the stockpile, tell everybody what we have and hope we get attacked by what we thought we would have. Now that's really not a national strategy. It also takes $5 billion or $7 billion to get that done. So the first thing we did was to set the goal. And the goal was not to wait 15 or 20 years, but to really create something revolutionary. And that's the original slide. To develop technologies that would allow the deployment of 100 million doses of a safe and effective therapeutic within 16 weeks of a new pathogen emergence. Just think of that, what we could do. If we can take something that new that came around, and it could be an infection, or maybe it's a new cancer, but take all this away and do it within just 16 weeks, how would that really change the world? Well, when you define the problem that way and set technical goals after everybody you know, lobs tomatoes at you for a few months, then you can really get around to business. So let me give you an example. The first thing you need to do is you need to be able to detect that there's something new there. And Amy Alving in the Strategic Technology Office at DARPA, we worked very closely together, uh, started a program called TIGER. And it was to create a new diagnostic system that could screen thousands of environmental or clinical samples in a day's period of time, amplify DNA, and not try to sequence them, but actually weigh them, just weigh the pieces through mass spectrometry, compared that to a database. Fast forward only four years, the H1N1 outbreak the actual virus that was causing it was recognized by the TIGER system in a clinical trial in San Diego at the Naval Station only four years later. We also figured out that we can't spend 20 years doing animal models. I mean, animal models are all we have right now, but why settle for them? So we actually created an artificial human immune system that fits in a 96-well plate, just like this. It was called the MIMIC system. And uh, I did get a phone call one day when it was the first transition, because our first transition partner was not the US government. It was actually a cosmetics company, because they decided they could do all their screening in our human immune system on a chip instead of doing animal work. Now this is being widely used by global companies to skip the many, many years of animal trials, or at least to em embellish on them, so that we could have a predictive system right within a, right within a, right within a single plate. One of the hardest problems, though, and it's why I started this, was the problem of manufacturing. How do we get out of the manufacturing problem that we've been so, so victimized by? So there's really two problems. Number one, it takes five to eight years and a billion dollars to make a new vaccine factory. 
and you can only make one product in it. That's it. And you got, can't change, can't grow bigger, can't go smaller. That's all you can do. And secondly, we've got to find new platforms aside from chicken eggs. So we started solving this problem at Texas A&M. Uh, the state of Texas and Texas A&M decided to do a project a few years ago that was completed last year called the National Center for Therapeutics Manufacturing. And what this really is is the first-in-class facility that doesn't cost a billion dollars, costs $50 million. It doesn't make just one product forever. It can make six products simultaneously. And by the way, if you need to change it, you can change from product to product overnight. And if you have a pandemic, you can surge tenfold to make that product within that time period. Now, how do you get that done? Well, one of the key innovations were these modular clean rooms, not built in concrete and stainless steel, but they're sort of like trailer park homes. They're like mobile homes, but they're clean rooms to create the cleanest environment. They literally plug into a facility like a toaster, so you don't have all this complex wiring, and they fly. So they actually can fly in a cushion of air bearings, push them around the facility. So what you've actually created is the ability to reconfigure on a factory level something that you could never have done before. So we essentially have an infinite variety of facilities within a single facility, a brand new concept that has really changed the whole world in terms of manufacturing. But once we can do that, we've got to get rid of the chickens and the eggs. So how do we really get rid of the chickens and the eggs so we can be prepared for the next pandemic? Many of you may have heard that in June, uh, I was fortunate to appear with the Secretary of Health and Human Services when Texas A&M and 18 subcontractors were awarded a major contract to develop a center for innovation in advanced development in manufacturing. This contract has an initial value of about $285 million with a potential value of about $3 billion. And its main goal are really twofold. Number one, to take all the risk of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear events off the table and to solve the pandemic problem once and for all. In fact, a key goal of our center and the two other centers is each to make 50 million doses of pandemic influenza vaccine within 16 weeks. So by 2018, our center will be able to do that and put that in the H1N1 outbreak context. That would have had 150 million doses of pandemic flu vaccine by August. No one would have gotten ill if they had gotten their shot. So pandemics will be off the table by 2018. We do that not by growing in chicken eggs, but what you see here are actually duck cells. Just a little incremental step, but we grow duck cells in big plastic bags like this, and they're hundreds and hundreds of liters, but they grow in culture, and we're actually able to infect the duck cells with the virus. They grow the virus, we purify the virus, and make vaccines, and we're doing that with our partner, GlaxoSmithKline from Belgium, who are all developing Texas accents right now. <laughs> the last thing I'll say is, what do we do if we really want to make 100 million or a billion doses of vaccine at a penny a dose? in a room about this size. And we're also doing that, and we're doing it in plants. This is an Australian relative of a tobacco plant called Nicotiana benthamiana. We can now infect these plants with plant viruses so that they can actually grow our vaccine proteins within their leaves. And in a room about this size, we've demonstrated that you could easily make 100 million doses of vaccine within a single month and at about a penny per dose. And this is really the way that the future will be done. It may be 10 years from now, but it's just really around the corner evolutionarily or in our time of medical innovation. So I close with one slide that I think I always closed with uh, when I was at DARPA and one that I closed with uh, yesterday. Uh, there are lots of people who say you can't get it done or it will never happen, particularly in the medical community. You'll never cure cancer. You'll never do this. you never do that. Well, the New York Times said the flying machine, which will really fly, might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanicians in from one to 10 million years. On the same day, the right said we started assembly today. <laughs> it's absolutely that time now. Let's get busy assembling. Thank you.